Very warm greetings to one and all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let us once again turn to Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. Now in chapter 23 verses 1 to 11. 1 to 11, there were the reminder of the wonderful things that God has done for the children of Israel thus far and the promises that continues to be with them and that God will not fail them, their life individually. Look at verse 11, uh, sorry, verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. Now every individual life of the Israelites can make such a big difference, can count for God's work on earth can count for his name. That is the greatest privilege, my dear friends, that your life counts for God. Now, but the warning is, but cleave in verse 8. You have to cleave to the Lord. Verse 11, take good heed. Again, the reminder that you love the Lord your God. As long as you do, your life will do well. You will have no regrets. Your life will matter. It will be very very useful, very, a great privilege to live such a life instead of a life that is wasted. But now, there are warnings. Now Joshua has stirred them, encouraged them, reminded them of God's promises. Now the warnings will come. Now, verse 11, now take good heed. Now if you will not love the Lord your God, if you will not, if you will love the world, love your current life, your present life, then he says, now if you don't take heed, verse 12, else, else, this is what will happen. Now else, and then verse 12, no, for a certainty. Now if you don't, then this will happen. No, for a certainty, without fail. No what? Now else, in verse 12, else if you do any wise, go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, then you shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you. These things will happen. Now when the Christian, instead of cleaving to God, cleave to the unbelievers, the world, your own pursuits, unequal yoke, what will happen? What will happen? Verse 13. Now there will be four warnings. 13 and 14, one warning. 15, another warning. 16, two warnings. Four warnings. If you are a Christian who say, well, never mind if my life do not count. Never mind as long as I'm going to heaven. I have all these things. I'm, I'm happy in this world. Verse 13 begins the warning. No for a certainty. Now what is no for a certainty? It is in the Hebrew, no, no. Right? For a certainty is translated from the word no. No, no. Of course, they won't want to translate no, no. <laughs> that the Lord your God will so on, so on. But when it's repeated this way in the Hebrew language, it's exactly what is this translation. No for a certainty, for sure. A double assurance to you that this will for um, 100% um, certainty will occur. Now, number one, that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations before thee. Oh, you think? You think it's all right? My life has been well. It will keep going on like that. I've been victorious, successful, no problems. Financially, physically, health-wise, family-wise, studies-wise, work-wise. No problem, but God says, I have always been the one. In verses 1 to 11, he said, I have always been the one that have been protecting, providing, keeping, helping, answering your prayers, enabling you. But know for certain, I will stop that. I will know for certain, God, your, the Lord, your God, it is he that always been doing and he will stop. The only one that has been helping you will say, no, no more. Now, how do, you, how do these words 
um, work in your heart? What does it strike in your heart and mind? I will no more. It's like a child going to the daddy and mommy. Lord, uh, mommy, daddy, you know, again, right, help me. No more. Your heart sinks. No more will I drive out these people. What will happen? Now, this part about, look at verse 13. They shall be snares and traps unto you, number one. Number two, scourges in your sights. Number three, thorns in your eyes until you perish. Three things will happen. Now, the first warning is a life of misery. A life of misery. How does God describe this miserable life? You think that all is going to be well, always going to be well, physically, emotionally, spiritually? How long will this last? How long will this misery occur to you until you perish from this good land? Until you die. That can happen to you. No more. This can be the last time that God is warning you. Now, please don't think that God does not issue warnings and say, this is the last time. That is what Joshua is telling them. Now, what is this picture that God wants them to see? The first one, there will be snares and traps onto you. What is that? Now, this is a description that God uses in many places in the Bible when he warns his people. He uses the, the fowler. He uses the hunter, which they will be familiar with. What they do to animals, he uses that to help them wake up. Now, snares are... Now, snares and traps, they work together, all right? That's why it's together, work, stress, and snaps. Snares are what is called the bait, bait, all right? So, they will bait the animal. What do they bait the animal with? Something that the animal likes, right? Right, you won't bait a rat with, with uh, vitamins, pills. You're not interested in that. It will bait, it will bait some, with something that is your weakness, that is what it is. It will, the smell, the taste, um, the, the sight of it, that is what you like. Right? That's what these animals will be attracted and drawn to. Now, what's the purpose of that? The purpose of the bait is to make the animal get closer. Get closer. Now, initially, the animal oh, a bit afraid. What? Oh, this is too attractive. This is what I like. All right? That's why they say for the rat, barbecue some meat. Right? The smell, the taste, they remember. So they, they will get closer. Now, the other thing is getting closer is not enough. It will want you to now get bolder. Get bolder. Some traps are designed. Now, I've, I've looked at some rat traps recently. All right? And it's very, very in innovative. You don't need to buy anything. All right? But the traps that are successful are the ones that make them bolder. They, eh? Seems all right. Not too bad. Right, so they, they let them eat something, the trail, they eat some of it first. Those that they eat at that point will not trap them. So then they get bolder. And then they get deeper. They go deeper into the trap. Now, what is the trap? The trap is eventually, it can be a net. It can be a loop that will now trap the person, trap the animal. Right? Very often on the leg, snap, and then the leg will be caught. It can be a string, it can be a metal thing, then it's stuck. Or it can be a net that will now engulf it. Now it's caught inside. The purpose of the snare and the trap is to draw and then after that to hold on to you. That is what it is. God uses that to describe to the children of Israel and to us today. Don't think that when you keep dabbling with sin and you say well not that bad right not that see nothing happened you won't begin to get bolder you won't begin to want to want to taste more of it and when eventually and when eventually you think that no this is all right but god says no for a certainty no, for a certainty, I will not help you. I will let you go deeper. 
and eventually it will grip you and now it becomes a master sin in your life something that you struggle with it's miserable a Christian if you are truly saved you will feel that if you're not safe you won't a Christian who truly is a safe Christian will have a love for the Lord it must grow but with that love you, when you are stuck with certain besetting sin you you feel miserable you get fed up you wish you could stop you wish you could get away from it now but God says you don't cleave to me you want to linger with them now there are three ways that a Christian end up like that one is I'm curious all right curiosity kill the cat right that's what they say that's how they trap cats make them curious you're curious uh, you know people talk about this computer game they talk about this um, this brand of things you know that will make you very classy you talk about these things then you get curious eh? you, you go and you go and look up look them up or it can be whatever something on the internet you know you shouldn't watch yeah, people talk about this they like it I have no interest in it initially curious what is this about what is it about then you go you go look or you go buy or you go taste curiosity there is one the other one is well is something that troubled you in when you first got saved right like for me it was music for you maybe something else you know your own weakness bait is about weakness then you you pray you beg God God please deliver me and then for many months even years you hate the sin but you keep going back to it like a dog returning to the vomit you're very ashamed after that you're very miserable after that whatever that sin is in your life and then you beg and you pray and then God delivers you God removes the desires or it could be even a sin right from the beginning God removed the desire God removed the desires then they are not a strong pool not a besetting sin anymore have you experienced that I've said many times Christian there is no sin that you cannot have that experience it's never God's fault God can always help you any sin there is no such thing as a master sin that can control the believer till he dies unless you do, you do not seek God's warning and then you pray and God removes and then you say you know just just a little bit just once I I've experienced the victory I can control myself right I can control myself now now these are things like for example some addictions some may be alcohol some may be um, gluttony some may be pornography some may be music worldly carnal music some may be well money love of money some may be even anger temper impatience some may be greed whatever is that lust that occur in your life those things in your heart it all can be a desire for success now initially when you became a Christian this thing fell off but then you say well, sometimes we, we say even I'm bored I'm bored right God deliver you from that computer game or from that from that addiction then I'm bored nothing to do and what you remember is doing those things I just just do it once and you say God God will forgive me God will help me God has helped me I experience it so you go back again then you take God for granted God will always help I won't go back to that misery anymore but God says no of a certainty God will no more no more that this may be your last time and after that it will come back with a vengeance it will trap you it will hold on to you and then again it becomes a master besetting sin all over again a little you know that miserable life right certain smell triggers off that some people is smoking some people is 
is the smell of alcohol. Some people, whatever is that smell, it triggers. And then you have to struggle. How wonderful it was when God delivered you. All these things has no more pull on you. Do you remember those days? Some, it could be gambling. A certain sound, a certain sight. Whatever it is, sounds, sights, that other people, other Christians have no problem with, you struggle with a miserable life because you go back to it. But you know how these things occur also? See how God describes it, verse 12. If you do in any wise, go back, go back. That is the problem, you go back to them. Let's go to that website again. Let's go to that event again. Let's go to that activity again. Let's go back to that friendship again. Yes, you go back. Now again, this in any wise go back. In Hebrew is go back, go back. <laughs> All right. So is in any wise is the word go. And then you have go, go. If you go, go back. Again, it's a double reminder, double emphasis. In any wise means in any way. Now Christian, in any way you go back. It can be your thoughts. You entertain those thoughts. It can be, well, I just try another similar, right? Similar kind of things. But this is not the same sin. Similar. I can go as near as possible, but don't cross the line. You just think of those things. You just go back and try again. You replace it with another thing, but it's a similar sort that will eventually entrap you. Go back. Or it can be an activity that you've given up, or a job, or a way of life. You say, I uh, bored, uh, I uh, itchy, uh. Just, just do a bit of it, uh. right? There is a meaning in any wise. Don't even think, don't even use any replacement, don't even do a, a filtered and reduced form of it. This is the meaning of go back, go back. If you go back, go back, that is what will happen. Now what else? And then you cleave onto the remnant of these nations. You do not want to separate. You still maintain certain close friendship. I said many times, God said you live in the world, you're supposed to be a testimony in the world, you are in the world, you're not of the world. All right? We're not asking you to be hermits. But you go and form this closeness with unbelievers. Now, young ones, you have learned many things, I hope, from the Bible, from young, your parents in church. How do you end up getting trapped in a sin? Addicted to whatever it is, media, music, um, fashion, to be carnal like the world, immodest. How do you get into that? Partying, how? God says is this, look, you, either you cleave to them or then he says in the last part, and go in unto them, and they to you, they to you. Not only you don't separate and you don't say, well, these are certain friendships that, well, they, were, they, were, they are bad for me. But no, they will come to you as well. They will text you. They will invite you to parties. They will engage you. They will be nice to you. They will keep engaging you. They and you go into them and they to you. You must be aware of that. At first you say, ah, you know, I don't like these things. Then slowly you read. Slowly you think they're fun. They're nice. Then you now hide in your room and you go on texting with them. This is how it happens. You go back, go back, you cleave to them and they come to you. It is very often through these things. God says, deal with it now. Deal with it now. Don't keep thinking that I will keep delivering you. It will come a point where I'll let you know that misery in your life. Do you want that? You know, it's so wonderful to see other Christians that, that God helps. They overcome. They don't go back. They stay away from things that they don't get curious about. They know those are not good. They don't want to try and find out. And then their life are just a life of, of, of overcoming godliness, holiness, Always joyful, knowing that their fellowship with the Lord is close. No sin in between. Things that 
bog you down, beset you. They don't have that. Such a wonderful life. But many Christians live for many years going through this kind of miserable walk. Now, then, there is this particular warning about this. Now, look at verse 12. You cleave, any wise, you go back, you cleave to the remnant among you and shall make marriages with them. Now, constantly, before they entered the land, constantly after the battle, constantly after the battles and when they are in the land and going on for years and years. This is one thing that God constantly bring up in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. The one thing that can destroy the Christian life, that ensnares you, that eventually traps you, will make you miserable is making marriages with unbelievers. Making marriages with people that are not suited for you. Marriages is one of the most powerful tools that can change your life positively or negatively. If it's God's will for you to get married, because it's one thing that you will, you will have to live with every day, every waking and even sleeping moment. You will do everything together. Every decision is now tied to the marriage as well. You have to think in terms of your marriage. That is why Satan will always use this snare and trap. Don't think that, well, what does church always talk about? It's always in the Bible. Did I choose this passage particularly for today? It's just there, it comes there by natural division. God will send warnings. God will send people. God will time and keep reminding because this is one thing that will make your life not count. But if you say, oh, I don't care if it doesn't count, well, we'll talk about that later. This is one thing that can destroy your life. That is why even from, from courtship days, why do we do so many sessions on courtship? Only enter courtship when it is the time, when you know how to choose, when you're ready, we are spiritually strong. Because that will be a time when you will go through a lot of turmoil, right? The teens tell me. I say, what do your friends struggle with? Boy, girl, relationship, cry, upset, make up, break up, quarreling, can't study, that kind of thing. It's one thing, emotions of the heart, relationships, marriage, is one thing can, that can really trap you in misery. When you make, um, when you try to separate, know that they will come to you, they will pursue you. If you go in onto them, say, no, no, I, I will stay away, but no, and they onto you, they will come to you, they will pursue you. They will flatter you. They initially say, well, well I, I won't, I won't. Right? That is what the snare is. I won't. Then, uh, okay, I'll just be friends. All right? I want to help the person to become a Christian. Just be friends. God says, no, just, just do not have close friendships. You can evangelize them as normal friends. And then slowly you go bolder. No, I can control my emotions. That, mom, don't worry, I can control my emotions. Yeah, singles also. God wants you to be single, you know. But I can control my emotions. Just, just close friends. You can control. Then you get bolder. And then you go deeper. And eventually, snap, it catches you. That is when you find that your heart is bound already. Now, there are many other things also. So this particular thing about marriage with unbelievers, also with wrong believers, don't think that marriage, as long as they're Christian. No, that mom, they say, he says he's a Christian already. She says he's a Christian already. Doesn't matter whether it's a godly Christian, a Christian that loves the Lord, genuine Christian. Never mind, as long as this person says, I'm a Christian now. That's fine. This is what will happen. This is the most, the one thing that is for life. Understand that. Now then, it will hang on to you. What are the things? I think I mentioned enough. The bottom line is snares and traps are meant to draw you and you want to flirt with sin we keep asking all right is this sin is this sin is this sin uh, until which point then it is it is not sin uh, it is sin this point is not sin yet right this kind of thing that kind of thing 
God says, be careful. All right, so it's like the rat going, uh, is this a trap? Is this not a trap? Yes, it is a trap. Anything that God says, don't have it. It is a trap. You don't have to ask, is this a trap or not? Finally, well, another example, then we move to the next one. At first you say, well, you know, it's okay. Let's take another loan. Now, this is a very common thing in many Christian lives. Maybe not among us, I don't know. I don't know your personal finances, your personal life. I take another loan to have this kind of things, to have this lifestyle, to have another property, to, to invest, to, to plan for the future. Yes, it's good to plan, but now you take another one where, where you eventually get snared. Now you are caught by it. Times are bad. You still need to pay your loans. Do not take loans unnecessarily. It can be loan. It can be any. Do not commit yourself to things. It can be a contract in a job. You take a contract, you don't think carefully. And then you're stuck. And they expect you to do things which are against your beliefs. They expect you to be at work. Whether you want to go to church, you want to stay close to the Lord, you want to fellowship, no. You're on contract. Think carefully. Don't end up with, well, it's just sign. It's okay. Well, well money. Your idols. And then it snares you. It's very miserable, my friends, when you do not when you do not, when, when this, now something becomes a master's besetting sin that keeps troubling you. It's a miserable walk. Now, the next one, what is a scourge? What is a scourge? Now, in fact, these warnings of misery, the first warning is misery, eh? miserable life. Don't think it won't happen to you. God will keep helping you. Miserable life is in intensity, it grows intense in its intensity. So first is this trap, this snare and trap, attractive. Yeah, you get caught. You're a bit miserable. Now it moves to the next level of intensity. Now, and, the, and, um, and scourges in your side. What is scourges in your side? Now, scourge comes from flogging, beating, or poking. All right? In other words, it will cause wounds. Have you had cut before? You have a scourge, a cut? Now after that, it's at your side, especially, why side? Side is very sensitive, right? This area is a sensitive side. It's painful. Now this pain increases. And at your side, means it's constantly there now. Because God promised, don't think, say, Lord, last time, huh? last time. God says, yes, last time with me as well. I'm not helping you anymore. Now some of this, it means it will be something that is a consequence that stays with you. That is very painful kind of consequence. God says now, don't fool around with traps. You get caught inside. It will develop to a scourge. You make decisions. Never mind, just, just, let's just go. Let's just do it. For yourself or for your family, then it becomes consequences that you have to bear for the rest of your life. Again, back to marriage is one of them. That's why God kept warning them. You will forever have at your side someone that will be a scourge to you. Now, as long as you are a true believer, you will not, find, you will not only find that this is miserable, this is painful. As long as you are a true believer, one day, one day, you will want to come back to the Lord. You will want to love Him. You will want to serve Him. You will want to be useful to Him. You will want yourself or your family and your family, if you're married, to be like that. You will. I've seen so many. Not it's because I've seen, but because God's Word says that it will be a scourge. It means God said, you will feel pain. Unless you're not a believer. If you're a believer, you will feel pain. So many wrong decisions of marriage people persuade do not wrong person wrong christian or unbeliever worse say no it should be okay many worked out mine should be fine too and then you go on and you just go ahead so many one day when you want to come back to the lord and you will it's called the preservation of saints many when that when the time comes they find a scourge by their side 
You don't go to church, your spouse say, why go to church? What for? You want to love the Lord, your heart is burning. I want to study. I want to know Him. I want to obey Him. I want to serve Him. No, once enough, once. Once a week, then later once a month. You see your children, you want to bring them in godly ways, bring up them for the Lord in godly seat. You say, no, 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 we are going for this kind of family. No, 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 they are going with that kind of friend. No, 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 buying, buying, buying these things for them. No, no, I want to play these kind of games with them. And you see, you're so grieved. One day you will want to love the Lord. Know this. Warning means it will happen and therefore know now and stay away. Like, that's why parents say this is a warning. Don't think that it won't happen. Look at this verse. I will no more. I will no more. One day say, you still want to go that way, all right, I will no more. Help you. It is very miserable. Or it can be a choice of something. Or it can be a giving in to sin. Something that now, it could be a crime. For more, he said, nah, no, no one knows. It's all right. God will forgive anyway. This is secret. No one will know. And you commit it. Crime. God says, I will no more help. Yes, one time, God delivered. Help you. Hope that you repent. Then you get bolder. I chat with you, right? My company CEO. Falsify business claims. They track it's not one time. And get bolder, bolder. Hey, didn't get caught. Or maybe suddenly almost get caught. <gasps> then you fear, right? Student, copy. You choose. Or you do something sinful quietly in your room. No, you think daddy, mommy, don't know. God knows. God said, all right, I'll help you this time. You, you're in trouble now. God said, I'll help you this time. Learn, repent. You repent and then you get, it's another time. And then finally, God says, no more. A knock on the police from the police on your door. Or a teacher call you by name. Come up. No more. And you pray out, God, please help me one more time. God says, I will no more. And that one time, maybe your last time, your last opportunity that you didn't want to take. And then it will be something that will always be in your life. That will bring you pain. Yes, you may be repent, but the consequence may continue. It can be even a decision for your child. I know of parents who say, I wish I did not send my child to those schools. I thought it's just because it's well known, it's what, but, it's, but it's a Catholic, Roman Catholic school. Never mind. You know, but they will get a good education. They will, they will know what to do. One by one, the child became Roman Catholics, grew up will not change. Some decision that parents say, I really regret for the rest of my life. And I don't know what to do. The pain. He drew back to God. You, if you are a true believer, you will draw back to God one day. But when you do, there will be so much encumbrances, so much, it's so much more difficult. Young people, fornication. That is something that can destroy your life and remain as something that is a mark in your life forever. God is warning you before you do that. Don't think that you won't fall into fornication. I've seen people, you know, very square girls, girls, dark frames, straight hair, very modestly dressed. You think these people won't commit fornication? Also fall into fornication. You think pastors don't fall into fornication? Many fall into fornication. Adulteries. Men who are married, women likewise, don't think, ah, just a little, just a little thought. In, in, you shall not in any wise go back. Don't go back, go back. Don't even think about the person. Don't even entertain those thoughts. And finally, it will grow. And then finally, bang, you committed adultery. And then after that, pain begins in your life, in your family. Singles as well. Some decisions that you make cannot be reversed. So now, when God wants all this, now this goading, so it's always now a pain. Very miserable. Now, that is the other thing about goading is they use sharp 
sticks to goad the animals, to poke, poke them, so that it will move in certain directions. That's how they get the animals to move in certain direction. Uh, there will be goadings at your side as well. Unbelievers will be like that. You draw close to them, you be in relationships with them, they, you'll be forced, whether you like it or not. You in your life will be constrained, and now you are stuck to go the direction that they want you to go. Your life is just about them from then on. Instead of a life that's useful to God, with other believers as lively stones, fulfilling royal priesthood duties, young men, young women that are useless, elderly that are useful to God, now you become someone that is just always in their company and you, you are stuck doing things that they want you to do. Do you understand that when God wants of all this, our natural thought is, this won't happen to me. These consequences won't happen to me. That is how we think. That is how people, you think people get involved in relationship, thinking they want to marry an unbeliever? No. Said many times, you go back, you cleave, then you shall make marriages. Now parents, does it bother you? Well, maybe I'll talk about that afterwards, about parents. Now, then what is thorn in your eyes? What are the thorns in your eyes? Now it gets worse. You know, wounds at your side, on your body, it's already very uncomfortable, very painful. But now, thorns in your eyes. Having a little speck of dust in your eye is far more uncomfortable, painful, all right, than wounds at your side, isn't it? Because the eyes is very tender, it's very sensitive. The pain will be worse. Every time you see something, you're just so grieved, so distressed. When you return to the Lord, or you see your children, in fact, sometimes I think it's more painful when you see your children, when you see your loved ones going through that, drawn away, right? So now it's everywhere you look, it's just pain. Now remember Lot's wife, right? God said, remember Lot's wife. What was the case of Lot? He allowed so much worldliness into his own life, so his singles know that. But his, he was a married man, Further, he allowed so much of that that now his wife became a very worldly person. Love Sodom, love Gomorrah, love the things there's so much. Now we can be the one that introduced this to others, to your children. Parents, be careful what you introduce your children to. Singles, be very careful what you let your friends introduce you to. They will develop the love for it. What what books do you read to your children? What do you let them watch? What do you let them listen to? Now, Lot was someone who chose to, to face Sodom and Gomorrah, eventually moved there, lived in this place which will expose his family to the worst kind of society. Now, I'm not saying we can't live in, in, in a bad place, but Job chose, Lot chose, Abraham chose otherwise. When you choose, when you know that it's a warning, you intentionally go there and expose. Then by the time his children, his children, where well, we know what his children did, now by the time they, he tried to convince them, it was so painful. He looked at them, tried to convince them, judgment is coming. None of them will listen, thought this person is joking. You're joking, right? You look at your life, you know, you never interested in spiritual thing now you tell us there is a real god and god is going to come and judge we, these things are so nice around us you you have built all these things for yourself for your family and now you tell them no don't love these things they will mock you and that is the most painful thing i still have elderly who tell me again and again pastor every time i hear messages like that my heart breaks no, Pastor, I'm not telling you not to say these things. I, I, know, I know you're not talking about me. But this is exactly what happened in my life. 
my heart breaks all the time. I don't want to listen to it, but I, need, I, I know I need to listen to it. Because now my children are no longer in church. My grandchildren, they're not interested to be saved. It's very sad. I come. You see, last time I was like them. Ah, the world is more important, it's more fun. And now when I'm old, I know I must come back to God. You will come back one day. Oh, the pain. They say, I, every time they come and visit me, my heart breaks. Every time I look at them, thorns in your eyes. Very painful. But another thing about these thorns is this. Now, thorn in your eyes is also... Now, when the thorn remains in your eye, when it goes deeper, let me ask you, what happens? Simple thing. It affects your eyesight. It will eventually make you blind. It affects your eyesight. What is it about? It intensifies. Now, I think this is the most fearful state. When God says, no more, and I'll leave you to it, and I'll leave them to do that to you, and I'll leave the sins to trouble you. Don't think one safe, always safe, right? Uh, all right, these things will trouble you. Yes, you're going to heaven, but these things on life, in life, they will be so painful. And I think this is the most frightening part where you cannot see that you are in that state. That is the most severe thing that God can allow in your life. What do you mean by you can't see? You can't see. You just can't discern spiritual things anymore. Because you have become so carnal, you're so trapped, you're so living that life with the, like the people of the world with their values. Now, when you hear God's word, I, actually, I can't understand. Why should we live like that? In fact, you look at your children. You look at your own life as a singer. Say, Everything is fine. I don't, know what, I don't know what our church is always harping about, warning. My health is good. I have a few properties. My children are professionals. They're all doing well. My life is set till I die. What, what bad things? You know, you have become so blind that your life is hardly spiritual. Your life is hardly counting for God. Your life is one that your children are astray, loving the world. And you even think that, well, you know, they are very important people in the world. You know, they, they have no time for church, but they are Christians. You think they are saved? Anyone who is saved will, will, will come to worship God. There will be that desire. Maybe backslided, but you say, you need to go to church to worship God. In their heart, they know, yes, I should. They know that they're living in sin, but they say, well, you know, they have all this, but they have no time for church. You, are, you have become so blind that this is the most frightening state, that there is no more pain in your heart even. That is a frightening state for singles. You commit and commit and commit and you draw yourself bolder and deeper into certain sins, certain things of the world, and you think, my life is fine. I'm living my own life. That's fine. As long as I have my job, I can go for my holidays, I can eat, I can relax. That is good enough. Blind. Blind to the fact that a life that counts, one to chase a thousand, is the only life that matters and that counts in this world, that is of any point, of any joy in this world. Blind to it. You're in a relationship, an equal yoke. All you see is this person, this man, this lady. And your life surrounds that. And all you want is, is to spend time with this person or even to convert the person. And your life is just taken up, trapped in there. While that whole other big area that God has for you to live for Him, you throw it all away. And you think, no, I am doing something good. I'm pursuing something good, something important. Blind. This is the most fearful state. Elderly as well. Encouraging you to know the word, lift the word, make changes that are necessary in your life because it's your last few moments on earth. We have received so many news this week of people dying. One, two, three, four. Four in one week. Four in seven days, or about ten days. 
just dying. Some believers, some not. But the point is this, elderly, you do not know when it is. Same for young ones. You do not know when it is. Your mother may be the one. Your father, the white-haired person, may be the one sending you, the dark-haired person, to the grave to bury you. You do not know. God says you do not know. This is your opportunity to make your life count. It's such a wonderful life. You throw it away. You are blind. You still think this is good. That is not the life that God meant for you. Now, the thorns in your eyes, when you cannot see Christian values anymore. Now, back to this marriage thing. Just now I said, I'll ask you parents. In your eyes, in your values, means your spiritual sight. What is the most important thing for your child? Is it to marry someone famous, rich, capable, certain class? Or someone who is godly, spiritual, loved the Lord, lives for Him? Which? Let me ask you. Because there are many Christian parents who say, as long as they say they're Christian, or worse, never mind, even not Christian, better than you know, marry this, this Uber driver. Yeah, yeah, he loved God, but Uber driver, right? What's wrong with an honest living? But you think you are so blinded. Your choices of things. You keep talking to your children about things of the world. And yeah, you may say, love God, love God, love God, but, but actually they can see what is valuable to you. But you are blind. You can't even see that you're promoting the things of the world and to love the world and the, 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 the attraction of the world to them all the time. But yeah, on, on the side you say as well, yeah, love God, uh, you must obey God, uh, you must go to church. Uh. But on the other side, wow, well, you look at them, so rich and you are. You look at that person, so qualified, so successful. At the same time, you are blind. Or perhaps as a single, you have also become blind. Where week after week, you hear what God wants you to love. But somehow you just say, there's no point loving these things. Nothing seems to work in your heart anymore. You have reached the most frightening state. You think that is a good life? You don't even know that you're living under a curse. And this leads to the next warning. Verse 15. Verse 15. Now, therefore it shall come to pass again. It shall come to pass. Know for a certainty, verse 13, now this other warning. It shall come to pass. What shall come to pass? That as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until he have destroyed you. Notice this word, it shall. The second thing to notice, as all good things, and so shall all evil things. God is a faithful God. Joshua reminded them all the faithfulness of God towards them. God is always faithful. God will continue to be faithful. But do not think that God's faithfulness is only about Him being faithful in keeping His promises to bless you with things to live for Him. He is also faithful. No, just as He promised to bless you, those things that he promised that evil will bring up, that he will bring upon you, so shall he also faithfully do to you. Now there is a Christianity that say, well, you know, God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. God just stated conditions. Verse 12, else if ye do this, then this will happen. These are conditions. Those of you who do programming, you know, if-then-else statements. If this condition happens, then do this. Then this will happen. So this programming language here. And this shall happen. Now, God, as I've reminded us, the book of Joshua is about the covenant. In fact, you will see. You will see that God talks about them breaking the covenant. Verse 16, when ye have transgressed the covenant 
The covenant have promises for blessing, promises of blessing for obedience. If you obey God, God will always help you. God will always bless you. God will always provide everything that you need to live a life that count, right? It is not for to live your own life. But if you will not, if you will not love your God, if you not cleave to Him, if you will not make your life come for Him, you want to live it for yourself, know that I will now chastise you. I promise you. Salvation is unconditional. There is no condition. God did not say, be a good Christian first, obey the Ten Commandments first, then do this and do that first, then let me assess. Okay, on these conditions I save you. No. No conditions on what you need to do for salvation. God says, I give you my grace. You embrace it. You receive it. You trust in it instead of trusting in what you do. Now, my friends, if you're not a believer, God also issues this warning. Now, you keep thinking that, well, my life is good, I'm living, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to work, I did not get COVID, I'm not going to die. God also issues the warning. Now, that evil things can come upon you and you can die. As you've seen, many have died. People die. Why not, would you not turn to God and say, Lord, I have sinned? I thank you that you have given me so, so many opportunities. All these things that attract me in the world. Lord, I'm not blind. Now I see from your word that these things cannot be compared to eternal things. I'd rather be saved than to enjoy these things for now. Well, that's another blindness that Christians have. You see the values of this world far more than God's things, than a holy life, than coming to church, being part of church, serving God, learning, growing, you want to be part of some other group. Blind. But now this salvation is unconditional, but blessings are always conditional. Remember that. Blessings are conditional, not salvation. God says it here. Because of my covenant. Now if you continue, a Christian thinks um, that you sin and sin, and sin, and God will continue to help you, and nothing bad will happen to you. Think again. Death can happen. We read every time, if any man partake of this unworthily, some slept, means you keep sinning, you won't repent. Never mind, take the Holy Communion. Never mind, do not. Holy Communion is to draw you to repent. Turn back to God, but you will not. You think that God will always close one eye. Teens, don't think that just because daddy and mommy do not know this kind of friendships that you're in, this kind of thing that you're secretly looking at, the people that you're, that you're, that you're close with that you should not be, that you know are dangerous to your walk, or whatever is the secret thing that you're listening to and watching. Don't think that just because daddy and mommy's eyes are not seeing, God does not see. Same for the adult. God will not close one eye unless you are not his child. Know that. If you keep sinning and sinning and sinning and see that your life and your blindness see everything is fine, no problem. I think we can continue in this. And there's nothing. God said, loves me, God saved, once saved, I'll be saved. And you think God will not chastise one day. God is saying... Well, I'll put it this way. Don't mistake God's patience with Him condoning your sin. He's patiently not going to chastise you yet. But there will be one time He say, no more. After this, chastisement will come. Now, these chastisements in verse 13 are the sins, sins natural consequences that will occur in your life to make you miserable. But not only that, on top of that, God said, I will bring upon you. I will bring upon you. He will chastise. Now, it's, now sin by itself and its consequences are already eventually very difficult to bear. But now you have God doing this to you. God sends people again and again. God sends messages again and again. God sends certain things that happens. <gasps> you almost caught. Then God delivers you again and again. And you still think that God will do so again and again? 
finally, fornication, wedlock, baby out of wedlock, finally, it happened. Finally, you think you keep stealing, finally, caught. Finally, you, you think you keep hiding from something, no one knows, you keep stealing, 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 whatever it is, shopping mall or, or supermarket or from company, no one knows. God said, finally, I will let them. I will be the one who do it. I will be the one who expose you. You, no, he's saying, no, do not, do not think that God will keep letting you go on. Now, if a Christian keep thinking, I can keep going on, you may not be saved. You better check your salvation. God is saying, if you're a believer, you will feel the pain. You will want to return. You will fear. But if you don't have that, you know what is a child that God does not chastise? God says, he is not your father. When there's no chastisement, you, you blindly think that is very good. Check your salvation. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. I do not know whether you are saved or not. You may come to church every week. You may even tell your children to believe in God and everything, but you may not be saved. You better be sure. If in your heart you say, can keep going on and it's okay. I don't need to be godly. And keep going on and think that God will not chastise. And there is no chastisement. If there is no chastisement, you better fear. You better wake up. God, am I saved? And then we go to the last, eh, another warning. So that is the second warning. The third warning is this. Verse 16. When you have transgressed, you see, another condition. When when you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then, again a warning, shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. The third warning, the anger of God specifically lighted against you. Many think that God does not get angry. God is a God of love in this dispensation. Uh, the problem with dispensation theology. God is different in the Old Testament than now. God is the same God. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. So God is eternally unchangeable. He is a God of love and a God of wrath as well, all the time. When you continue to break the covenant, God, I say I'm a Christian. God, I say I will obey you. God, I say I want to be saved and I will live for you. But God, I'm going to live my life with unbelievers, going to pursue this, going to spend my life for myself. Now, if you say my life don't need to count for God, the covenant has a purpose. My, I don't want to live for God. I want to live myself. I want to live for myself as a Christian, but for myself. It is still breaking the covenant. You know the difference, right? Don't think that I, I'm a good Christian. I live a good Christian life, I live, but I live for myself, no, the covenant is always lived for God. Now then, God said, I will be angry. Now what is this anger? Now this, now it says, and the, um, verse 16. Now anger of the Lord. Anger here is about the nose. I've described this to you before. The nose flaring. You know, sometimes people draw a bull that is angry bull. When the bull is angry, it's very frightening, right? So when they draw a bull angry, how's the bull's face? smiling, very relaxed. No, the nostrils are very big, right? And then they draw hot air coming out, correct? Ah, this is the description. This is a description of God looking at you and God nostrils flaring out, all right? Anthropomorphically speaking. Angry at you. Don't think that God will always love me because there will come a time. Oh, God will always forgive me. God will always understand when I come back to Him. I'll come and do, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, tears, crocodile tears, God, really, you know, this thing is going to happen to me, sorry, Lord. God says, no more. Angry. Parents, you do that as well. You know when the child is no more. It's, you now say, now I need to chastise you. So, know that God can get angry at you as a believer. Are you still living in sin and you keep thinking you can live in sin? Don't think that God is looking at you and smiling. Now, last few weeks, I've been preaching about how God loves you, how God wants to help you, how God wants to make your life count, how God gives you privileges. This week, I cannot not tell you this. God himself describes his face to you, to you, kindled against you. And what is kindled? Not only this anger, fuming, furious. This kindle is 
light a fire that is very intense and burning and explosive. I said, you mean, you mean God, God gets angry at me as a believer like that? Yes. You are one safe, always safe. But don't think that God does not have anger at you. You don't tell a child. A parent can get very angry at a child. Doesn't mean that the parents say, you are no longer my child when I'm angry at you. You're still the child. The Christians don't live week after week. Keep thinking you can continue in this sin. Now, the chastisement can be your death. If you do not want to live for God, what is the point of God letting you continue to live on earth? God already said, a tree that does not bear fruit, waste of space, cut it down. God is talking about trees, of course, to teach us about life. You think God will not cut down your life when you do not want to live for Him? The fact that you are not dead yet is God's patience. The fact that if you're an unbel unbeliever and you're not dead yet, it's God's patience. Don't confuse it with God condoning your, your particular lifestyle and what you're doing in secret. So it's not only, Lord, I will be miserable after you deliver, I go back to say I'll be miserable. This thing will become a thorn in my side. It will reach a stage where God said, I will, well, it could be take away your health and you lie in bed forever for a young person even. It can be take away something that is painful for your life. It could be your child just to wake you up. Sometimes it's most painful when that chastisement happened. But do not think that this won't happen. Now, I'm not saying that anyone who dies young, dies early, dies of sickness, dies and loses a child, they are God's chastisement. I've repeated that many times. I'm not saying that. But you will know in your heart when the chastisement comes that God is angry at you. You know, right? You know. Your face will turn pale. Don't think that you cry to God again. He will help you. Now, you do not, the point that Joshua is making is this. I have just told you, you just need to obey God and love Him and obey His commandments. Don't fear obeying His commands. The only, you do not need to fear enemies. You do not need to fear any enemy on earth. You just need to fear not obeying God's word. Not even fear the battle, not even fear dying. Just fear not obeying God's word. I've, I repeated that last week. You only need to fear that. But you know, here he is saying now, God has become your enemy. He's angry at you. He's fuming at you. He's furiously um, burning in his anger against you. Do you know that is the most fearful thing to have? God, your enemy now. Not enemy as in, as in he, he won't save them. But is it not true with, with Israel now? They are going through all these chastisements. It's before our very eyes and we don't want to learn. I've seen this in many people's life. They make a choice, then they're stuck in it. Then by now they say, Pastor, my life is in a mess. I say, well, even in a mess, just repent. Turn back to the Lord. Make the right decision. Pastor, cannot already. You know, the deep financial thing we are in and my children, they are entrenched in this and, and not my citizenship and my house. My Pastor, you know, for me to even repent, the amount of pain that I will go through is so difficult now. Say, well, God's chastisement is upon you. Don't think that you keep going on and say, God will forgive me. Something may happen next. God in His mercy is now chastising you hard. So don't fool around and provoke God in this way. God is loving. That is why He chastises you this way. So don't go back and think, am I like that? Am I like that? Now why are many of us not fearful or not caring? Because we fail to believe in something. Look at verse 14. Now he says, Now, behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you, you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one, good, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God has spoke concerning you. They all come to pass. God never failed you at all. What is he saying? Why are you so blind? Why are you so foolish? Why don't you believe and trust that what God wants for you is the very best? 
and He will never fail you. Whatever He asks you to do, you just do. You just obey. He will help you and it will always be good. Yeah, even it's very difficult now. Trust. You think that this person is good for you. Trust that God says, do not marry unbelievers. Just believe. But we don't believe. We don't believe. We doubt God's love. He said, now, don't you know God's love to you? You know in your hearts and in your mind. You have experienced this. You know. But why don't you believe that having a life that counts for God, why don't you believe that it's God's love to you, that that will be the best for you now on earth, not to have this misery, not to have these consequences, and in eternity? Why don't you believe that you have experience and know in the hearts of us and, and mind? Why not? You still think this is better. The problem is we don't believe that if I live this life like that as a father, as a mother, as a child, as a single, as an as a elderly, I don't believe that this is the best. But you know, God, he says, search deep in your heart. Why don't you believe if you still think that this relationship this job, this pursuit, this game, this, pers this ambition is good. Go deep in your heart. Don't think, as I've shared on Friday to some young people, when God wiped away tears on earth, uh, in heaven, God is not saying you, have, you go to heaven, wipe away tears, you're, now you, be, you have no regrets, you're just joyful. Everything is, is, is high and joyful. Wipe away tears are the tears of your persecutions, your bodily pains in, in this sinful body, your troubles in this world as you live as a Christian, the difficulties of life in the sinful world controlled by Satan. All those things that, that bog you down, that trouble you as you walk for Christ. He said those things will not be there anymore. You will not cry because of these things anymore. But the Christian will always know my work's all burnt up. You will always look at Christ's near, near pierced hand and say, Lord, I wish, I wish I lived for you instead of for this relationship, for this job, for this pursuit, for this ambition, for this money, for this title. I wish I did not. You will always have that regret in your heart. Always. And you see other Christians who live for him and their rewards and their usefulness and their, their ruling with Christ. Many cities. And you say, Nothing nothing for eternity don't be blind for eternity now i'm not saying that we are going to heaven we work for god because we want many to rule many cities but the point is you will look at all this these things will be in your eyes forever and ever i live my life for myself yes i had what i want but when i'm in heaven i know why i am like that lord how i failed you there will be that eternal emotions in your heart right parents Right, children? When your dad, mommy, forgive you, you know you did something very terrible, they told you not to, and then you go to them, you cry, forgive me, and they did. And every time you see them, you get even more ashamed. And when they love you, you feel even, more, you feel even worse. How can you still love me like that, right? That will happen. Why? So, so here, Joshua, God is saying, I am telling you this now before I die. Before I go the way of what I tell you now, for your life here on earth and for your life in eternity, cleave to your God. Love Him. Make your life come for Him instead of something else. It is worth it when you see Jesus. Now, in closing, I want to say, I want to tell you a story, a, a, a story about these traps, scourges, and death, eventual death. You know how they catch wolves, the Eskimos, how they catch wolves? They are very difficult to catch, especially in the snow. And they are very, um, very wily, they run very fast. But the Eskimos, well, they, they will eat, they will, they will attack the livelihood. So the Eskimos need to trap them. How do they trap them? They will put chunks of meat or fat, leave it there. All right, then the wolves will come. So that's the trap. That, that's their snare and trap. They smell. They can smell from where they come. Then they will start to eat it. But what the wolf don't know is when it gets bolder, gets closer, eats more of it, everything's fine. Yum, eat. 
and finish up the meat. All right? Finish up the meat. So nothing happened. It's pretty good. Come back again. But this time, they will put the meat with something inside. They use certain animal um, whales' um, fins. Now, the whale fins are very interesting. They can, when, they are, when they are wet or moist, they can be folded up. Folded up. They are sharp, sharp pointed. They can be folded up. And then they fold it up, tie, tie a, try a string around it that will melt. Right? So the wolf will come and eat. So they put a few pieces of that. So the wolf will eat, eat. Now, this time, no more. No more chance. It will eat, go in. Hours later, a few hours later, or can be even days later, the string will be dissolved in the stomach acid. And because it's moist, it's wet in the stomach, the blood and the... You know, now, this, this, this sharp animal um, um, fins or things will begin to ex open up, all right, spring up. It's like putting a spring, a sharp spring inside. It will now start to open up. And then it will start piercing, tearing the wolf's internal apart. It goes from snares, traps. Now it will feel pain, scourges in its side. It will feel immense pain. It will struggle. But it's nothing it can do now. It's tearing it up. And eventually it will die a painful, lonely death. That is what God is describing here. That is what Joshua is warning the people about here. Do not take this lightly. If you continue and continue unrepentant when God keeps sending and sending reminders and you still say, never mind, next time. I'll repent next time, later. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 372, 372. More holiness give me, 372.